that you actually decided to join us. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening from wherever you are joining us from. Last week we started a new someone series called How Are You Really Doing? And we hope by the end of this uh, someone series, by the end of this month, you'd actually be able to answer that and to also know your identity in Christ. And so right now we're going to do a couple of songs and we invite you that you join us wherever you are. Come on, let's go. Wherever you are, put your hands like so.
and all that we have to do is lay our lives for him to use us and for him to begin to change us from the inside as we're going through this series there's a lot of things that we go through because it's not a perfect world this is a broken world and it's sad that it's broken but we have a savior we have a savior in the holy spirit that lives in the inside of us so as we surrender our lives we give ourselves as a living sacrifice for him to use us it's the highest form of worship just laying your life down Father, today we have more than a song. We're bringing our lives to you, O oh God. May our lives be acceptable, O oh Lord. I brought myself. I am the sacrifice. I have more than a song. myself I am your worship I have more than a song today I brought myself I am the sacrifice I have more than a song
of worship, oh God. And may, may be our lives, oh Lord, reflect what you have done in the inside of us, oh God. How we walk, how we talk, Lord, how we think, the things we engage ourselves in, oh God, may be a living sacrifice, oh Lord. Heavenly Father, we are so grateful that we know you and that you've called us your children. And we have confidence in this, that we will enjoy eternity with you, O God. So receive all the honor, all the praise, and all the adoration. And it's in the name of Jesus we have worshipped and the people of God say, Amen. Amen. There's a lot lined up for you. Pastor Carol is coming with the second installment of this sermon series. It's going to be amazing, guys. morning, good afternoon, or good evening, whatever time it is that you're watching from. My name is Pastor Carol Wanjao, and I'm an executive pastor here at Mavuno Church, and I'm so excited to be bringing God's Word to you today. Last week, we began a new series on emotional health, and it was entitled, How Are You Really Doing? And we said that all of us suffer from some level of emotional or mental health imbalance. And um, this is because of our alienation from God, which comes from our refusal to believe that he exists and that he cares. And so we seek other ways apart from God to meet our emotional needs. And all these ways we discussed last week leave us empty. And we also say that this is the source of all our anxiety and stress, whether at work or in our relationships. And so I would encourage you, if you did not listen to that sermon, uh, please go to our YouTube and listen to it. I tell you, it will make a big difference in your life. So today we want to look at emotional well-being at work. And what we realize is that prior to the fall, Adam and Eve lived, uh, and Eve lived in very idyllic work conditions where everything cooperated and worked as it should, making their rulership or dominionship a joy. You know, they enjoyed fruitfulness. I'd imagine that, you know, they would drop a seed and it sprouts and it grows. Uh, they were effective, and the joy of having God as their partner in whatever they were doing just really fulfilled them and completed them. However, this was rudely disrupted when Adam and Eve fell for such Satan's lie that God was withholding out on them and that they should only trust in themselves. And from the moment they believed that lie, they lost everything. They lost their authority to rule. They lost their spiritual cover. And, and their allegiance shifted from God to Satan. I mean, that was so profound. And with this shift came a release of forces that now came to work against them and by extension to us. And so today we're going to examine the nature of these forces and also show how these forces contribute to stress, anxiety, conflict, and loss of emotional and psychological well-being, but now specifically at the workplace. So I'd like us to turn to Genesis uh, 1, 17 to 19, and just read this so that we can understand exactly what happened. What are these forces and what ha how, did, how did that come about? So we read and it says, to Adam he said, because you listened to your wife and ate from the tree about which I commanded you, you must not eat from it, cast is the ground because of you. Through painful toil, you will eat food and from it all the days of your life. It will produce thorns and thistles for you and you will eat the plants of the field. By the sweat of your brow, you will eat your food until you return to the ground. Since from it you are taken, for dust you are and dust you will return. Let's just pray as we, as we go through this. Someone. Father, I thank you. I thank you, Jehovah God, for your word. I pray now that as I speak, that I will decrease and that you will increase. And I speak, Lord, that even, and I pray, Lord, that even as I speak, your word will take root in our lives and, and, and that we're going to hear you and that your spirit of wisdom and revelation will come upon us so that we understand these words and exactly what you'd have us do. For we pray these things in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, amen, amen and amen. So we find that Adam and Eve listened to the devil and when he advised them to just do you, you know, let's forget God's plan and do your own thing, the results were catastrophic. And we are still dealing with them today. And here are some of them. 
And I'm just going to list a few of them. There are many, but I'll just list a few of them. The first one is painful toil. It says over there in the Bible, cast is the ground because of you. Through painful toil, you will eat food from it all the days of your life. So, what, so we realize that whereas before this work had been created to bring them joy, to bring them fulfillment, to bring them meaning, Painful toil now became their reality. And I'd like to ask you a question. Have you ever found yourself working in a job that you really hated? You know, I remember when I was a student, I got an administrative job working at a school where, you know, where, you know, I was studying. And we needed that job as a family. And so I appreciated the money, but I, oh my goodness, it was a job that I still remember today because of how boring it was. I mean, I dreaded going to that work. And it's because all day long, I was stuffing letters into envelopes, mailing them out, arranging catalogs that would be sent across the world. It was the same work day in and day out. I mean, talk about boredom. Talk about painful toil. Aha, that job just killed it for me. And I know for many of us, it actually starts from school. You know, we hate the environment. We hate the work we do and the work that we have to put in. For many people, I mean, we just think about Monday and we just say, oh my God, it is Monday. And when Friday comes, we say, thank God, it is Friday. And we find that we leave for the weekends uh, because work is not joyful. It, is, it has no meaning. It is painful toil. Other people may even envy you and wish they could do your job, but for you, it is nothing but painful toil. And painful toil is not only seen in those who hate work, but in fact, those ones who love their work. Because for them, they have bought lies like, the success of my career or business is all dependent on me. They've bought a lie like, the bottom line is all that matters and I'll do whatever it takes to succeed. They've bought a third lie, which is the amount of money I have is a true measure of my success. And then the fourth lie is that there is no God purpose at work. And so for people who believe these lies, they can be successful and wealthy, but they're in great danger. Like the person Jesus spoke about who gained the whole world, but then lost his soul. So work is meant to be a tool towards accomplishing a purpose, your purpose. Work is not your purpose. And yet for many, we are not human beings. We have become human doings. We're defined by our work. We're defined by our careers. In fact, we take great pride, you know, in saying, this is who I am, and we introduce ourselves by our titles. But this was never God's plan for us. It never was. We should not be defined by our work. So if the first was painful toil, the second one is the, the result of our rebellion is that there, we, we work in toxic work environments. Or, the, or our rebellion causes toxic work environments. Let's listen to verse 18. It says, It will produce thorns and thistles for you, and you'll eat the plants of the field. So we find that instead of our workplaces being pleasant, full of life, meaning, the work, our, many of our workplaces are very toxic. And they're characterized by the thorns and thistles instead of good crops. And so the beautiful offices and furniture hide the political undercurrents that are going on there, the backstabbing that goes on behind the scenes. And I just remember a story that a friend of us told us recently, and she was telling us about her boss at work. Now, this man was so or is so obsessed with making it to the top, and he's quite ruthless about it. In fact, he's the kind of guy who has no qualms blaming his reports for any blunders he makes, He's so stingy with information that anyone he, super, he supervises is likely to fail. It's, it's as if he's cutting out competition. He takes glory for any presentations done, yet he does not share in contributing to those ideas. And he's also the kind of guy who has a funny way of warming his way to the director's heart so that other people end up being fired instead of him. And so as a result, my friend was really complaining and just saying, oh my goodness, work is just so, it's so draining. My workplace is just so crazy. It's so toxic. It's so, there's so much conflict. 
Now, I don't know if this sounds familiar. I don't know if you can picture this person in your office, you know, the toxic boss. But I just hope that as we are pointing fingers to him, it is not us. You know, when we point, there are many fingers pointing at us. But this toxicity is also shown in many of our workplaces by how people use all manner of unethical ways to make money. And it's often at the expense of workers and customers. For example, in Kenya, uh, we've had a huge increase in cancer cases. And, um, and, and, and people are beginning to wonder, and research is beginning to ask, is it, could it be because of eating food contaminated by chemicals? And we find that despite farmers knowing too well that they should wait for a certain number of days before, you know, after spraying their fertilizer before they can sell their produce, they still go ahead and sell it anyway. You know, not caring that they're harming their, you know, their, their consumers. And we find that in workplaces, people undercut and sabotage their workmates as they try to get to the top. We use corrupt means to cut deals and people even mistreat their workers. So I know for many of you here, as you listen to this, you've worked in a toxic environment. You know, prickly spaces, ungodly spaces, spaces full of corruption, theft and backstabbing. And many of us have worked or studies in toxic environments and have experienced sexual harassment and demands for bribes. And we need to realize that this is the consequence of the fall. It's a consequence of the fall, toxic workplace. Now, the third thing that we realize as a result of the fall are frustrating results. And we read this, uh, the verse says, by the sweat of your brow, you will eat your food until you return to the ground. And so we realize that instead of an environment that is cooperating, you know, uh, so that, you know, if it's a shamba or it's a, you know, people are able to produce food, Adam and Eve now have to wrestle and fight with the ground in order to survive. How many of you have found yourselves hustling so hard, yet being frustrated by results? You know, you start a business, you work hard, but it's barely feeding your family. Or... You have worked so hard at your career, but you're still so far from where you should be now. Or you're making good money, but somehow you never seem to enjoy it. You know, as pastors, we counsel so many people with various work issues like uh, joblessness, uh, like frustration of not progressing in life despite you know, putting in great effort. We counsel people who have, you know, just have a pattern of failure in their life. You know, just when things are about to succeed, Failure comes in. But we also counsel other people who are tremendously wealthy, but then they have other issues like lack of satisfaction of work, lack of work-life balance, succeeding at the work at the expense of family. They bear debt. There's marital inf infidelity. There's conflict. I mean, so frustrating. And we find that, you know, all these things just add to multiplying our stress and anxiety. But I want you to listen to me. This is not normal. You know, it's easy for us to get used to dysfunction. But this is not the way God create, intended for the workplace to be. The fact is that pain and frustration, the pain and frustration you're experiencing is because your workplace is unredeemed. And the enemy is having a field the day there. And God has put you as a believer in that workplace so that you can redeem it. You can pray for it. You can call down God's kingdom so that you can begin to enjoy the kingdom of God, of God at your workplace, which is characterized by love, by joy, by peace, by fruitfulness, and a general sense of shalom or well-being. And this, friends, was God's original plan. Genesis 1.28 says, God blessed them. In other words, God bestowed Adam and Eve his favor as he commissioned them to work. God's favor was upon them. He wanted them to be effective and productive at work. And so when he told them to be fruitful and multiply, you know, frustration and failure were not God's plan. Stagnation, lack of progress, laziness, unfruitfulness, lack of success, wars on workplaces were not God's plan but the enemies. And so what do we do if we're to turn our workplace from a place of frustration and stress 
to a place of health and joy. And we're going to be looking at just some three, you know, pointers in how we can achieve this. And so the first one is we enter God's rest. Remember, we talked about, in Psalm 1, we talked about going back to Eden, going back to God's shalom, God's rest, uh, God's, you know, general well-being. So if we want to do that, we enter this rest by surrendering ownership back to God. Surrendering our workplaces, surrendering our means of production, surrendering our businesses back to God. I mean, if you look at Psalm 24 verse 1, it says the earth is the Lord's and everything in it, the world and all who live in it. And this verse means exactly what it says, that the whole earth belongs to God, including your business, including your career, including your education, indeed even those exams. But do you know that many of us do not live with this reality? And how do I know this? Because of the fear and the anxiety and stress that we all go through. And that includes me, by the way. <laughs> and I have much experience in that. You see, much as this psalm says that God is the owner, it says that he's the landlord, it says that he's the business owner, he's the owner of your career, you know, we still operate as if we are the landlords. And no wonder... We are facing landlord issues. Did you know that landlords have unique issues? You know, what do you do when your ceiling is leaking? You call the landlord. How about, uh, you know, when your plumbing is not working? You know, you may get irritated, but you're not responsible for these things. The ultimate responsibility and repairs belong to the landlord. But many of us act like we're the owner, and so we carry stress that does not belong to us. Uh, there's a certain king who received a powerful God, word from God one day when his nation was under attack and he was you know, just so stressed about it. And this is King Jehoshaphat in 2 Chronicles 2.15. And this is what God told him through a prophet. And it said, listen, King Jehoshaphat and all who live in Judah and Jerusalem, this is what God is saying to you. Do not be afraid or discouraged because of this vast army. For the battle is not yours, but God's. And so friends, do not be discouraged. Do not be afraid. Because of the battles in their workplace, they are not yours, but they belong to God. Do not be afraid or discouraged of the sickness in your loved one uh, or what they are going through, because the battle is not yours. It belongs to God. Do not be afraid or discouraged because of the problems in your business or your career, because the battle is not yours, it is the Lord's. The success of your business or career does not all depend on you. God has already said that the battle belongs to you. You know, we have taken on emotional issues like fear, anxiety, tension, and depression is normal, but they are not. Some of us are so used to popping pills, painkillers. This is the enemy oppressing you because you have not fully understood that you're not the landlord, but God is. So enter into God's rest by surrendering ownership back to him. And we're going to be doing that practically in a short while. So that's the first thing. Give back that ownership to God. The second way that we operate from God's rest is by letting God lead. Let him lead. Uh, Jesus said to, the, to his disciples in Matthew uh, eleven twenty eight, 28, he said, Come to me, all who are, re who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Now, can I be real? Some of us do not know what the word rest means. And this is because you do all the work. You know, remember the faulty uh, thinking that I talked about earlier, where in our minds we think that the success of our career or of our business all, all depends on us or how we think that the bottom line all depends all on us or how we think that my worth is measured by my net worth you know when we have this thinking then we push ourselves so hard we willingly sacrifice relationships with our colleagues with our family members and even our health at the altar of success and yet rest is God's gift to humanity. 
You know, we naturally, you know, may associate rest with sleep. But do you know there are many people here who can't sleep or rest without sleeping aids? And, you know, I can hear some nervous laughter. And, and you know, the only reason I know this is because I'm one of them. Or well, let me just say I used to be one of them. Insomniac Club International. You know, we exchange notes on the best natural sleeping aids that are not addictive or that have adverse side effects. But do you know what the real issue is? Worrying too much. Worrying too much. Instead of sleeping, our minds are busy, you know, trying to solve not just the day's problem, but the next day, uh, if not the rest of the year, as if worrying and being fearful will solve the problem. You know, I've come to understand that the best way to start the day for me, because I've said, um, you know, one, a person who worries easily is to surrender every meeting, every assignment, everything that could possibly go wrong during that day to God. And I do so during our 430 prayers. And I really thank God that we have an opportunity where we come together and pray in these 430 prayers because I have found them to be so, so encouraging. There are times when I have come and I'm discouraged. And, 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 and you know, I have had people sharing testimonies of God, God coming through for them. And so I know, yes, God, you're also going to come through for me. And so these 430 prayers have become a lifeline to me. Because once I hand the keys to God at the beginning of the day, then for the rest of the day, I have the assurance that he is the one in control. And Jesus said some very powerful words to his disciples. And this is what he said. Therefore, I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or drink or about your body, what you will wear. And he asked them, is not life more than food and the body more than clothes? Look at the birds of the air. They do not sow or reap or store away in barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not much, are you not much more valuable than they are? Can any of you, by worrying, add a single hour to your life? I mean, think about it. And why do you worry about clothes? See how the flowers of the field grow. They do not labor or spin. Yet I tell you that not even Solomon in all his splendor, was dressed like one of these. If that is how God clothes the grass of the field, which is here today, and tomorrow is thrown in fire, will he not much more clothe you, you of little faith? So Jesus went on to say, so do not worry, saying, what shall we eat? What shall we drink? Or what shall we wear? For the pagans run after all these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough worry of its own. And what God is saying, he's got it. He's got it. Your rent, he has it. Your business, he has it. Your career, he has it. Even that exam, he has it. So do not worry. And when we let God lead, instead of stress and anxiety, when we allow him and we say, thank you, Lord, you have this, then we experience peace and freedom. And so the question I, I have is, are you ready to let go, to let God lead? Are you ready to let go? Are you ready to tell him, God, take over and to allow him to lead? So that's the second, allowing God to lead. The third one is that we enter God's rest by cultivating an exalted view of God. You see, I've come to understand that worry and anxiety are good indicators of a small view of God. In our 430 prayers, we always start with adoration and we worship God for who he is. I mean, Psalm 100 verse 4 and 5, it says, enter his gate with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him and praise his name. For the Lord is good and his love endures forever. His faithfulness continues through all generations. The Lord is good. This is what this psalm is telling us. This means his actions towards us are good. You know, many times as believers, when things go wrong, we often blame God. You know, God has done this for, to me. He's punishing me for my wrongs. And we take offense with God. But the Bible says God is good. And we need to affirm that despite the situations that we are going through. 
In fact, I know there are times when I have affirmed his goodness and the situation has changed. We do not worship God because God needs our worship. We worship God because we need to remind ourselves of who he is. When we exalt God, we are reminded that he's greater than any situation we are facing. We remember that God of power loves us with an everlasting love. And as we do all these things, our problems take their rightful place. God takes his rightful place, which is why worshiping God and adoring him is a powerful uh, tool for dealing with stress. And in Philippians 4, 6 says, do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present these requests to God. And the peace of God which transcends all understanding will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. God will do it. In fact, it's not even you. It says over there, God will guard your heart and mind in Christ Jesus. God himself will do it to you, for you. It is a gift from you, for, from him. And so wake up early in the morning and engage in our 4.30 a.m. prayers. See it as your essential daily meeting with the true boss, you know, Take time to meditate on scriptures that speak, about, that speak about God's greatness. This will benefit you more than watching a series or scroll, scrolling through reels. Because unlike these activities, you know, meditating on scripture resets your thinking. And this helps us put your problems in perspective. So learn to speak back scriptures of God's greatness over your situations. Just say, Lord, I exalt you. When you come in the morning, I exalt you over this situation. I exalt you over my workplace. I exalt you over my family. And honestly, when you do that, God comes in, takes his rightful place, and your problems become small. And this enables us to enter into God's rest. Finally, as I conclude, I want us to understand that what the world teaches about success and what God teaches us are totally opposite. The world teaches us that it's all about us. That succeeding in life is totally dependent on our efforts. No wonder we experience so much frustration, so much stress, so much fear, so much anxiety, so much depression. And not so with God. As we trust him, he provides a way for us and he helps us if only we will trust him and if only we will enter into his rest. So today I want us to pray. And I want, us to, and I want to lead us in doing two things. Number one, I want us to pray a confession, a prayer of confession and repentance. Because I know we are all guilty, including myself. And I want us to repent and to confess, you know, the self-serving ways we've conducted ourselves as far as our productivity and provision is concerned. We have truly moved away from trusting God to trusting in ourselves. And then the second thing I want us to do is to covenant with God and to give back God ownership, our means of productivity. And so if you're at home, I know that last week we had said, bring your, uh, uh, your certificates, uh, bring your letters of appointment, bring your business plans. And if, if uh, you're at home, I want you to just gather those now so that we can pray together. So as I have been preaching, I know that the Spirit of God has been speaking to many of you and you recognize the self-serving ways that you have been operating. If this is you, I just want you to come clean so that we can pray together. And what I want us to do is to have this prayer projected on our screen so that we can truly just repent together. We can truly come together to God and ask him for forgiveness. And so I hope by now you have gathered, gathered all these things, even as we start to pray. So let's pray. And I want you to repeat after me. Dear Jesus, I come before you seeking forgiveness. I confess that I have been serving myself at, as far as my work and career goes. I confess that I have believed Satan's lie that the success of my career and business all depends on me. I have believed that the bottom line is all that matters. And because of that, I have done questionable business deals. 
I have also believed the lie that my net worth is my only true measure of success. Leading me to compare myself with others and to have unbridled an ambition. I also confess that I have believed the lie that there is no God purpose at my work. And so my business and workplaces do not reflect the glory of God, but rather the works of Satan. I ask you, Lord, to forgive me. I repent of these things, Lord, and I ask you to forgive me. I reject these lies of Satan and bind these deceiving spirits into the pit of hell, which is where they belong. I uproot the spirits of anxiety, of fear, of oppression, of depression, of manipulation, of jealousy, of insecurity, of conflict and anger that have been uh, operating in my life as a result of living out these lies. I bind these spirits and cast them into the pit of hell, which is where they belong. And I ask you, Lord, to cleanse me with the blood of Jesus and to heal my spirit and soul from the wounding effects of these defiling spirits. And I invite you to fill me with your Holy Spirit and to anoint me with your wisdom and knowledge because without you, I am nothing and can do nothing of eternal value. In Jesus' name, amen. The second thing I want us to do is to lead us into a space where we covenant with God and give back ownership to Him. I want us to surrender our businesses, our careers and studies because our means of productivity truly belongs to Him. And so I want you to just put out, if it's your certificates of incorporation or your, uh, of your, or your certificates from school or even your letters of appointment, because I want us to covenant these things back to Him, to give Him back the ownership and we're going to be doing that by making a covenant with him. And so I'll ask you to repeat this after me again. Now I say your name, my name is Carol. Do hereby covenant and surrender to you, the living God, my means of productivity. I commit to seeking you, your will over my studies, over my business and my career. I also commit to conducting myself according to your word and to act righteously at work and at school. I invite you, Lord Jesus, to take over my business, my education, workplace and career. And I invite you, Lord, to fight my battles for me. For I know that you have overcome the enemy and that with you I am victorious over these situations that I'm facing right now. I declare that failure, poverty, stagnation, frustration, lack of purpose is now gone in Jesus' name. And I now dedicate my educational pursuits, my business and career to you in the name of the Father, Son and the Holy Spirit. And we're going to be anointing this. And so I'd encourage if you have your anointing oil to, to anoint your, your certificate, whatever it is. And we anoint it now in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. So well done. That is a serious thing that we have said before God we have covenanted with him that he takes care of our business. We've covenanted with him that he now fights our battles at our places of work. And we have covenanted with him and said that we're going to act in righteous ways at school and at work and in our business, not taking shortcuts because we are putting our faith and our trust in him. So next week we shall be looking at the emotional health in our family. We shall be, you know, examining the factors that influence emotional health at home. And we shall be looking at solutions that resolve these issues. And so as a takeout, we shall be rededicating our families back to God. And so what I want us to do is to bring 
our marriage certificates if married, and family portraits so that we can pray uh, for this, uh, for your family. And so if you're online, I'd encourage you to actually come to church so that we can do this at church. But if you have no way of coming to our Mabuno church near you, then I'll ask you to just prepare these things ahead of time so that when it comes to praying, you will be able to do the dedication for yourself at home. And so until next week, see you and God bless. Thank you.